This is the No Fear Podcast. We know what scares you. I'm Matt. I'm Mel. And I'm Lisa. And this is the No Fear Cast, a podcast where we dissect horror and all the things that scare us. This is episode 24, the last official episode of our sixth season. Join us as we take a look at the state of horror and offer some recommendations on what should be on your radar for spooky season. All right. Well, I will be getting us started for this episode. So like Mel said in the introduction, we're kind of wrapping up the season six and we're also, we've wrapped up our summer of sharks with the last episode being the the one we just released two weeks ago on Sharknado. So we thought that we would just kind of put a pin in the season by just sort of wrapping everything up with a a nice kind of reflection on on the season and in particular the summer of sharks then uh, also just give some recommendations uh, and just discuss what we've been reading what we've been watching lately uh, just those kind of things just to kind of maybe put some things on your radar that maybe you aren't aware of I know whenever we do these recommendation shows I definitely take my own notes because Mel and Lisa always mention things that are definitely getting added to my to be read or to be watched lists and uh, unfortunately most of those have still been on there (laughs) because that list only gets bigger over time but uh, just to kind of give my own I guess reflection here since it's the end of season six which I think is just kind of an uh, amazing thing here i I know we've had some behind the scenes discussions uh, about you know the podcast and some planning discussions and the fact that we've been doing this for six years now is just kind of feels kind of insane to me to be honest I, i certainly had hoped that we'd still be doing this at this point when we started out with our our first episodes but i wasn't sure how long it would last so um I have to say it's it's been a blast and I, I'm still loving it. And as far as the summer of sharks goes, well, um, I, I I had a lot of fun. I enjoyed a lot of these movies, even as as terrible, absolutely terrible as they are. But I think, um, and and I certainly don't want to speak for Mel or Lisa here, but. I was starting to feel it by the end that I was getting a little burned out. (laughs) So I think it was a good time for us to, to wrap up our, our summer series because those, those shark movies, some of them were just so, so bad, (laughs) but that's not to say that I didn't enjoy this. And and I I do love the topic. Um, I'm glad we watched some good schlocky B movies because that's, that's always fun, especially in the summertime. So I guess to kind of kick us off in terms of stuff that has been on my radar lately, um, I'm actually going to recommend a book that I was recommended by a friend of mine, and I just just started it I'm about halfway in, uh, but I started it about two days ago, and I'm loving it so far, but uh, it is... and. Well, let me preface this by saying that we do normally try to keep a a pretty good G or PG rating on this show. So uh, after I say the title, uh, I'll probably just sort of uh, dance around it, but I will will say the full title once. (laughs) But it's a book by an author whose name is Brian Osman, A-S-M-A-N, and the title of the book is Man, Fuck This House. And uh, it was recommended to me by a friend who... Uh, we were talking about Grady Hendrix, actually, and talking about the upcoming adaptation of uh, my, uh, why am I drawing a blank on it? Uh, the, the Teenage Exorcism. Uh, uh, that's my not the right friend's... name of it. but uh, My best friend's exorcism. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Lisa. <laughs> I don't know why I just drew such a blank on a book I love so much. But... <laughs> anyway, uh, but yeah, so my, my friends and I, we were talking about Grady and uh, that the op- the uh, upcoming Amazon Prime adaptation of My Best Friend's Exorcism. 
and she said, hey, you need to read this book. You'll love it. And so she loaned it to me. And it is so far, it's it's very similar to, to kind of Grady Hendrix's style. So if you've read some of his books and, you know, My Best Friend's Exorcism, Horror Store, uh, Southern Book Club's Guide to Slaying Vampires, uh, his most recent one, uh, Final Girl Support Group. I know he has another one coming out fairly soon as well. Um, if any of those are things that you've read and are interested in, I think you'll probably really enjoy this because it's a haunted house story, but it's not the traditional haunted house because so far the the ghost is actually uh, helpful. Uh, the the encounters with it, uh, he's helped put away moving boxes, and he he drew a candlelit bath for the the mother of the family because she was feeling stressed. So uh, it's kind of a a different perspective on the haunted house, but with the title like that, uh, I, I think there is going to be some twists and turns. And my friend did hint that there there may be some some changes in tone as the book goes on. But it, it's really funny in that sense that I mean it's it's very much playing with the the haunted house stereotypes while at the same time kind of inverting and subverting them. And of course, one of the children. Uh, his name is Damien, and he is a very brooding, uh, almost like Damien from The Omen, except the whole thing is an act because uh, he he does it because he thinks he's funny, because he's super smart and just very bored. And so in reality, he's just a typical like 10-year-old who likes playing Fortnite and texting with his friends, but then will act like a, a weird demonic antichrist child in front of his family just to mess with them. So um, I know this sounds kind of random, but, but it's so far it's a, it's great. And uh, I, I had never heard of Brian Osman before. Uh, I definitely um, uh, assuming that this, the second half of this book is, is as good as the first, I will be looking up more of his stuff as well, but I, I, I find it hard to think that, it will be a letdown just as, as good as it's been so far. So uh, Man F This House by Brian Osman is uh, is my first pick for you. Matt, I, I've seen the cover of that book several times and thought if there was an award for like a best book title, I feel like it has to go to that one. I don't even know what the book is about, but I already... I already want to read it just based on that alone. So I'm really glad to hear that you're enjoying at least the first half that you've read of that book because it just looks so much fun. I was definitely sold just by the title as well. So uh. <laughs> That's fun. Um, well, I'm glad you mentioned uh, Grady Hendrix's uh, upcoming adaptation. I'm really looking forward to that. Um, that's coming out September 3rd. 30th on Amazon Prime. And if you listeners, if you haven't read the book yet, I would highly recommend getting it before the film comes out. Um, just because it, it's su such a fun book and it needs to be read. I'm sure the, the movie adaptation is going to be great. But um, well, my first, I don't know if this is so much a recommendation as it is something I'm looking forward to kind of in the same way I'm looking forward to uh, the Grady Hendrix film adaptation. Um, and that's, there are two films on Shudder that I've heard some really great things about that I can't wait to like, to just have a kind of a quiet night where I can sit down and, you know, really get into spooky season. And, and <laughs> leading up to Halloween, I really want to watch some of these things. So um, I haven't seen them yet. One is Glorious. That was directed by Rebecca McKendry. Um, on Shudder, it stars Ryan Quanton from, um, I guess most people know him from True Blood. That's like his, what he was best known for in J.K. Simmons. And it's described as like Lovecraftian horror. I think by what they mean by that is it's like cosmic horror. Um, and it's about this man who's on a road trip and he stops at a rest stop and finds himself kind of locked in the bathroom and everything goes downhill from there in like a really terrible way. And I've heard really, really good things about it. And then the other one that I've heard really good things about that's on my list 
is called um, Moloch, M-O-L-O-C-H. I'm assuming that's like the ancient god. <laughs> um, I don't know if I said that right, but it's um, a horror film out of the Netherlands. And I've heard, I want to say now three people recommend it to me. So I always, you know, when one person recommends something to me, I'm like, oh, okay, I'll check it out. But then when more people come up and say like, oh, there's this film you've got to watch. It's really, really good. Um, I'll put it on my list. So yeah, I think between Moloch, Glorious, and My Best Friend's Exorcism, like those are probably going to be like the top three films that I check out when I actually have a chance to. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. Like I said, every, um, every year this time, like September, October, I like to carve out some time just to really focus on all the really great horror movies that are coming out. And um, those are the ones I'm excited about. So it's kind of a cheat. It's not really a recommendation. It's more of an anticipation, maybe. I guess we'll allow it. Um, <laughs> mine is actually um, a recommendation. And it's also kind of a follow up. Um, so when I was thinking about things that I had read this summer and the past like month or so, uh, I kept coming back to T. Kingfisher's What Moves the Dead. And uh, people who listen to the Monster She Wrote podcast might have heard me talk about it when I was reading it. And I know on this podcast, we talked about our, our StokerCon debrief. And I think uh, we were all excited to see that book there and to be able to read it. And so I, I read this one as quick as I could because I, I really love Kingfisher's book, The Twisted Ones. And so I was excited. And what made me even more excited about this particular Kingfisher uh, novella, I guess you would say, um, is that in this one, uh, they're taking on Edgar Allan Poe's The Fall of the House of Usher. So I don't want to spoil anything. So I'm just kind of going to read through the summary that you can find if you look at the back of the book and then talk just a little bit about what I thought was fascinating about it. Uh, when Alex Easton, a retired soldier, receives word that their childhood friend Madeline Usher is dying, they race to the ancestral home of the Ushers in the remote countryside of Ritania. What they find there is a nightmare of fungal growths and possessed wildlife surrounding a dark, pulsing lake. Madeline sleepwalks and speaks in strange voices at night, and her brother Roderick is consumed with the mysterious malady of the nerves. Aided by a redoubtable British mycologist and a baffled American doctor, Alex must unravel the secret of the House of Usher before it consumes them all. Um, so there was so much going on in this really short novella that I thought was really cool. Uh, Kingfisher plays around with like the idea of the Gothic by having the created uh, Ritania like, European countries. Um, Kingfisher also just really does fascinating stuff with the fall of the House of Usher itself. I love stories and novels that tell you what was going on in the background, and that was so cool. And I love the focus on the fungus. What what happens with the fungus in the story is so fascinating. And when I was a kid and I had to read The Fall of the House of Usher and then ended up enjoying it because I was like, oh, this is awesome. I wish we were reading more stuff like this in school. Um, I was struck by the phosphorescent fungi and I was like, why aren't we talking about the glowing fungus all over the story? And for years and years, when I think of The Fall of the House of Usher, I immediately think of that weird pulsating light that's described by the narrator. And I guess there's just so many other crazy things happening that no one cares. But if you ever read that story and thought, why isn't anybody worried about all the phosphorescent fungus? Kingfisher takes that and just weaves a fantastically horrifying tale of what it could possibly be doing and how it could be affecting these people. Um, it's also got some funny moments in it. I just, I read this in like, I guess you say one and a half sittings. I got interrupted the first time or else I would have finished it. And I sat down and finished it up. And I listened to an interview with Kingfisher after I read the book and a sequel is in the works. And I really want to get back with the narrator, Alex, and go along with them on even more adventures. So uh, I hope the sequel's coming along quickly because I'm excited to see what happens in it. And I'm excited to see what else Kingfisher does. Well, that sounds really interesting. And uh, like I said at the beginning of my intro, uh, I just added that to my list of uh, two be read <laughs> so um so so my next pick here is uh 
kind of like Lisa's, it's one that I have not read yet, but I am looking forward to reading next, actually, as soon as I'm finished with my current project of, of uh, Man F This House. Uh, it's a book that actually just was released yesterday. And so if you've, uh, by, sorry, I, you are listed, listening to this in a time-shifted environment. So by yesterday, I should say uh, Tuesday, September 6th was the day it was released. It's uh, Stephen King's new novel, Fairy Tale, which has been getting really great reviews. And I think what really stood out to me was one reviewer said it's the best thing he's done in the last decade or so, at least. And yeah, I, I think we all know with Stephen King, master that he is, he's also extraordinarily prolific. And so some things tend to be better than others. Um, but this one so far has gotten really good reviews. And I'm definitely excited to jump into it probably within the next few days, as soon as I'm finished with this other book. Excuse me. <clears throat> the uh, the plot is, uh, from what I can tell, basically uh, a fairy tale of sorts. It's about a, a regular high school kid who uh, whose mother was killed in a hit-and-run accident, and apparently he had to kind of learn to take care of his father afterwards because he was grief-stricken and turned to drinking to, to deal with the pain. Um, but about seven years after that event, he meets a person, uh, kind of a recluse, who, uh, when he passes away, basically leaves this kid, Charlie, his house, and a cassette telling a story about how basically there is a portal to another world where the people are in peril, and it's a epic battle between good and evil and uh you know I, I i'm just kind of looking at an overview here but i so i don't want to even give too many spoilers or read too many spoilers on it but it, it sounds to me like typical king at his best kind of stephen king in that era of the gunslinger uh crossed a little bit maybe with eyes of the dragon mixed a little bit with uh his his jfk novel so um, I'm definitely excited to read it. It made based on the description, it sounds more along the lines of one of his more fantasy oriented stories than horror per se. But you know, Stephen King has definitely built up such a reputation as a horror author that I definitely feel safe <laughs> discussing and recommending him on this podcast. But um, yeah, I, I think what also really gripped me was I, I read in one of the reviews that i was looking at that he's kind of started this idea during the pandemic because he sat down and thought what basically what would i write that i would really like to read myself and i think you know as writers that's always an important question and it, it was really interesting to me that he this is what he came up with because uh, it sounds to me like if he was that interested in it himself, then it's going to be even even better because of that. So I don't want to spend too much time uh, talking about this more since I haven't read it yet, but I'm definitely excited to get into it. Uh, you know, I haven't read every one of Stephen King's books and some of his more recent ones I've actually just kind of passed by and said, you know, I'll get to them at some point but haven't come back to them yet. But this one, this one I, I plan on reading next. So um, hopefully, hopefully I won't be disappointed, but uh, I'll try to remember once I'm finished to weigh in on uh, the next episode after I finish it and let you all know kind of my thoughts if, if I remember to. I really want to read that one. I, <laughs> I had a hard time not running to the bookstore to go pick that up the day it, it came out. Um, but I, I'm trying to be better about reading books I bought, I've i already bought before I run out and buy new ones, although that one was really tempting and I'm gonna read it eventually. I, I love it when King steps out of the horror or when he does things that are like horror adjacent. Like I always really liked, I mean, I love his horror stuff. Um, it, you know, he's written some of my favorite horror books but 
other things like when he did 11 22 63 for instance and you know it, it is kind of in the like speculative fiction there are horror elements i think in that book but i don't know i just i like it when he does that that kind of um yeah just steps out of that horror because we know he can do horror really well so well the book i'm going to recommend next is one that i've read uh it it's probably no surprise because i'm sure i've talked about it many times uh is reluctant immortals by gwendolyn keist uh, she's a favorite of mine um i love her her other books um i like her short stories in particular uh one where she reimagines the dracula story from lucy's point of view um and so you kind of get to look at at i think it's called the eight people who murdered me i may have the number wrong in that <laughs> i should have looked it up but it's a really it's a really great story it's, it's available online I, I believe it was published in nightmare magazine so you can find it but um, in Reluctant Immortal, she takes that character of Lucy from Bram Stoker's Dracula, um, who, for those of y'all who remember the book, she was Mina's best friend who was a victim of Dracula. And she she becomes a vampire, I don't know, I'd say a quarter of the way through the book, a third of the way through the book. Um, she's the one who the they see, you know, kind of walking outside and boys call her the blue fur lady if you remember that, but um, in this book, Lucy is, of course, an immortal um, because Dracula has turned her. And so because she can't die, she is still living well past the pages of Dracula. And in fact, this takes place in the late 60s in partly in Los Angeles, but mostly in San Francisco. And so it's this really great, like, historical period piece of, like, that kind of summer of love, hate Ashbury, you know, 1960s, um, San Francisco, all the, it, it reminded me in that way of the book Emma Klein's The Girls, which I really enjoyed. Um, but... Yeah, this one just, it takes that character of Lucy, um, and Keist really, I think, breathes life into that character in a really fascinating way. She also, I'm not going to say too much because I don't want to, like, spoil the book, but she also takes pieces of Jane Eyre and weaves it through this, too. So, it's it's a really good book. It's It's gothic, it's horror, it's um, history. It's a reimagining of several pieces of classic literature. And it's, it was a really, um, it was one of those books that I read very easily. Like I, it drew me in immediately and I, I read, I, I burned through it pretty quickly. So, um, and it's got a really great cover too, I will say. I'm a sucker for, for good cover art on a book and Reluctant Immortals does not disappoint. So that's going to be my recommendation for something that I've actually read and enjoyed. I guess in a way, the book that I'm going to talk about now is kind of like met with your, your first book. It's about a haunted house. And also I have not finished this book yet. So yeah, I'm not sure if you can call this a recommendation so much as I'm going to talk about something that I'm reading and enjoying so far, but I don't feel equipped to say, you know, I, I haven't read the whole thing. So I don't know how it's going to end, but this is white smoke by Tiffany D Jackson. This is a young adult horror book and it caught my eye when it came out last September, like a year ago, because well, the cover is pretty arresting. But also, I had heard that it was a haunted house story, and I do like books about haunted houses. Um, I'm probably going to add the one that you're reading, Matt, to my to-be-read pile at one point, at some point or other. Um, but yeah, I'm like, I haven't looked at my Kindle for the exact number, but I think I'm probably, I was going to say I'm like between 40 and 50% of the way through it. So basically, your main character is Marigold. And I'm just going to talk about kind of the very beginning and set it up. I'm not going to go into anything that would be like, is there a spoiler? 
And something happened to Marigold in California. You get it in slow doses. It's not something that you, you find out right away. And the family, which uh, is her brother, her mother, and then stepfather and, this, and her stepsister, um, kind of like have to leave. The mother keeps saying that they need a fresh start after whatever happened with our main character, Marigold. And so there's a lot of, yeah, I think you have like kind of that young adult idea of the coming of age. So she's going to have to deal with a new school and a new place to live. And she's going from California to, I guess, somewhere in the, the Midwest. And the mother has won a writing residency with this uh, company called the Sterling Foundation that is advertising that is trying to revitalize this town by having the writers who get residency stay in these remodeled homes and then they're going to like help those people with the mortgage so that they can buy those homes and have home ownership and it's going to grow the city and when they get there they find out that the sterling foundation may not have good um intentions and that there's a huge history going on here not only with the their house that is really creepy and weird and is the only one standing on their block um but also the town itself has a history um and so so far there's a lot going on there's almost like cult vibes going on um there's a lot of like small town horror vibes going on because the people in the town know way more than they know because they just showed up um and so and so far i'm enjoying it and some of the haunted house stuff is pretty creepy i made the mistake of reading this one particular scene uh before i went to bed last night and i was like okay you know, this, <laughs> this this cannot happen you know luckily i didn't have any doors creaking open on me or anything like that or lights coming on all of a sudden but uh yeah i mean i think if you like haunted house narratives you would like this so far from what i've seen because there's a lot of like haunted house tropes um but i'm looking forward to seeing what happens with those tried and true tropes um, so yeah, I'm enjoying it so far. It's been marketed as the haunting of Hill house meets get out. So I'm interested in seeing how, how that works out. Um, and it was, you know, it's, it's been, uh, recommended by some outlets. So, and I've seen a lot about it on Instagram too, and other people reading it. So, uh, I, it's so far so good. And, and I'm in, I'm enjoying it so far. And like I said, it's got some, some creepy parts in it that I think, have been pretty effective, at least against me, but I'm easily terrified by haunted house narratives. So let me see here. I guess we'll just go ahead and end it there, guys. I feel like we have a pretty good mix of things that we're reading now, that we're enjoying, things that we've read that we really think were uh, great, that we wanted to pass on, and stuff we're looking forward to that we're excited about. So I will just go ahead and take us out. This may be a little bit short in the typical main, but uh, listeners, as Matt was saying, this is kind of the capstone on our crazy summer of sharks that we did. And this is kind of transitioning us into starting our seventh season um, as, as fall comes upon us and spooky season comes. So we really hope you've enjoyed this kind of glimpse into what we're reading and what we're anticipating. So we're at No Fear Cast on Twitter and Instagram, and we have a Facebook page. Our email is nofearcast at gmail.com. As always, um, if you still have a movie you, you thought we should have looked at during Summer of Sharks, or if you have any comments about some of the stuff that we talked about um, in this episode, please reach out to us um, on social media or through email. We enjoy hearing from listeners. If you love what we're doing, consider supporting us on Patreon. Um, if you're not able to do that right now for financial reasons, we completely understand. You can tell a family member, tell a friend who may be interested in the show, or simply rate and review us on your podcatcher, uh, which is entirely free and helps other listeners to find us. Theme music by Nicholas Gasparini, and we will be back with a brand new episode. <laughs>